now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the world over. About two million people are diagnosed with autism in the U.S. alone. Half a million are children. One in 54 are boys. My next guest has very personal experience with autism. At three years of age, his perfectly normal son, Owen, suddenly stopped speaking. The boy couldn't sleep or eat. Owen's only relief from his withdrawal from life were the animated Disney films he watched with his brother. Tonight, our Unseen Hero segment features Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author of the new book, Life Animated, a story of sidekicks, heroes, and autism. Ron Suskind joined me recently via satellite to discuss this inspiring memoir, his family's struggle with autism, and the power of affinity therapy. Here's my interview with Ron Suskind. Ron, you and your wife noticed when Owen was about three years old, he just stopped communicating. What did you see? What did you think at That's that right. moment? Well, you know, we, we were just uh, the typical happy family moving forward. Two boys, uh, my older son is five, Owen, uh, mm -hmm. at that point was just shy of three. And, uh, you know, first we, we didn't notice uh, and wondered. We, we didn't know what to think. You know, we, uh, you know he, was stopped. he stopped speaking. He wouldn't make eye contact. He was very uh, unhappy. And, um, and it was a mystery, like uh, there had been a kidnapping. Wow. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I said to my wife, kids don't grow backwards. What could right. this be? And then a few months later, uh, we heard the word autism for the first time. And then later, even after that, we were told this is kind of uh, called regressive autism. Yeah, what does that mean? Where just shy of three years old, somewhere between a year and a half and three of the kids regress, meaning they go backwards uh, and lose speech. He lost all speech, so he couldn't talk after that. Hmm. And, and the doctors at this point, um, they, they were at a, bit of a, at a bit of a loss. He is watching Disney films obsessively. And the doctors right. caution you about indulging what they called his obsessions or his fixations. What did you think? That's right. That's right. That's the thinking at that point and has been for many decades uh, that these affinities, his obsessions, uh, are not healthy. Uh, that many, many kids on the autism spectrum, which is now about 3 million folks in the United States and 70 million worldwide, and, and mind you, it's one out of 42 boys, according to the Centers for Disease Control uh, just this spring, uh, that's 2.5% of the male population of the United States. Extraordinary. Wow. The view is, is that these, uh, these passions, these obsessions are more prison than pathway, that the kids get involved in this, it's like a wheel in the ditch, mm -hmm. they can't get out, and you should try to wean them off of it or cut it off. Um, and, um, and we got that advice for many years from very fine specialists who we had great admiration for and, and still do. Uh, but what we found is when, when he watched his Disney favorites, which he loved before the onset of the autism at about two and a half, uh, he just seemed contented. The only place he seemed happy and contented was there. And then uh, he was speaking in bits of gibberish uh, after about a year, you know, just like baby talk. Mm -hmm. And at one point he was saying, Juicervos, Juicervos. And then we were watching uh, one day The Little Mermaid, uh, all of us, the two of us together, his older brother. Uh, and all of a sudden he was rewinding the part where Ariel, the protagonist from that movie, loses her voice, has to trade uh, her voice to become human. And the sea witch says, just your voice. He rewinds again. Hmm. After a minute, my wife says, he's not saying juice. He's saying just. I grab Owen. I say, just your voice. He says, juice or us, juice or us. Huh. And at that moment, we saw something that has turned into a new way of looking at autism and maybe how to treat autism, too. Well, it's called affinity therapy. We called it Disney therapy when uh, Owen was young. We had to give it some kind of name. And, uh, and now it's, it's changing the way, I think, uh, folks uh, see this this condition and and Ron explain to people what you believe your son took from the repeated viewing of these Disney movies and why these Disney films it was basically a handful of them Aladdin Little Mermaid Beauty and the Beast yeah. sort of the hand-drawn 90s cartoons yeah and, and back and he went back to Dumbo and mm -hmm. uh, you know Snow White and all the rest the hand-drawn seemed to have more of, of a hold on him what we found is that 
and, and this is something we're, we're hearing from many, many parents, is that these hand-drawn animated uh, features especially that are emotionally rich have a particular hold on this community. Uh, because the, the exaggerated uh, uh, expressions of the characters and the scenes that you can understand even with the sound off as Walt Disney uh, way back told his animators that's what he wanted mm -hmm. uh, allow a kind of safe place where these kids can rewind again and again and draw deeper and deeper meaning from these iconic stories, frankly, stories that go back thousands of years that human beings have always used to make their way in the world. Hmm. Well, Owen and many kids like them uh, have had to live on a diet of what they can see and hear. These movies rewound over and over again. Um, uh, very exclusively or, or in great concentrations and they've drawn meaning from this. So, so uh, as Owen says, he had to live in a diet of myth, fable, and legend for so much of his life. Huh. But what it built in him was an acuity, an understanding of the power of story in yeah. shaping our lives. And that's something all human beings know. Hmm. Uh, it's just this extreme case of Owen and so many kids like him are teaching us this, uh, this powerful lesson now. Ron, was it the moral clarity of these stories? I mean, there is sort of a strong through line in all these Disney classics. Yeah, there's no doubt that that was part of the hold. And Owen can talk about that now. He's, he's a little like Temple Grandin, uh, <laughs> that well-known autistic lady. Owen yeah. can describe what it felt like now. He's 23. <laughs> but yeah, that was a big part of it. It was not just the emotional richness, but it was the moral precept. Hmm. Uh, the moral prescription and lessons in these movies that he held tight to. And, 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 and it really helped him he find his them voice. early on. Exactly. And what's interesting about it is as he, as he walked out into the world as a teenager, he began to test these in the world of shades of gray, of human interaction. Does love last forever? How does one uh, end up being true to oneself? Uh, is the nature of friendship uh, lasting? Uh, you know, what does it mean to see beauty uh, within? And, uh, and that's what uh, gave him such powerful moral clarity. And, and it was helpful also with his religious life. Uh, we're Jewish, mm -hmm. and Owen, uh, you could feel the spiritual energy and the, and the moral mm -hmm. energy coming from these movies yeah. as something that enlightened and, in, and in energized him at his bar mitzvah. Uh, when he gives his bar mitzvah speech in the in the book, which is quite moving. Beautiful. No, it's beautiful. And I, I love this line he wrote where he said, I'm the protector of the sidekicks and no sidekick gets left behind. Tell me what importance that had in your life, in his life, and your understanding of where he was and how he saw himself in the family. Well, it's fascinating. That, that's when he got his first real whack. He was thrown out of a school uh, for autistic spectrum kids and learning disabled kids. It was a stretch for him. It was difficult, but it was really his home. He'd been there for five years, and of course, these are kids who have trouble with change. He's about 11 years old. He doesn't have enough speech to really describe how he feels. He goes down to the basement of our house, and this is the place, mind you, where we play out the movies. Mm -hmm. Once we realized a few years before that if you threw him a line, he'd throw you back the next line, we started to, to become animated characters. We became all of the key characters in all the movies. That's how we conversed with them. We spoke in Disney dialogue. Hmm. He goes to the basement, and after a while, we see he's drawing furiously, uh, and he's drawing sidekicks, huh. uh, no heroes. Uh, and, and he becomes an expert on the sidekicks. He doesn't feel now like a hero himself. He, he feels like a sidekick. A sidekick helps the hero fulfill his destiny, but, but not for him. And, uh, and at the end of a book, uh, a sketchbook with a hundred sidekicks, no heroes, he writes two things. I am the protector of the sidekicks. And finally he writes, no sidekick gets left behind. But my wife is Catholic and, um, and she says, well, that's, that's out of uh, either the New or the Old Testament. Uh, that, that is a powerful philosophical position of uh, the notion that we really are all sidekicks deep down. And the key is no sidekick will be left behind. That, that became his view of his place in the world. Hmm. I love that he goes on to college. Um, he, he's now dating. He starts a Disney club at, at college. Tell me about that. Tell yeah. me how Owen's doing now. He's doing great. So, so he, he, uh, uh, he just graduated from this college program after three years. Wow. Uh, he started Disney Club as soon as he gets there. Uh, and, and at that point, I'm at Harvard. I'm the writer in residence at the Kennedy School. Mm -hmm. We drive from Harvard Square out to Cape Cod, where his school is, and there's a room full of Owens. There's 12 <laughs> kids just like him. 
And, and they were not raised, these kids, under the intense affinity therapy method that we had developed. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. Many of them, they had the same passion Owen did. They said everything can be found in these iconic myths and narratives. And, and we basically said to these kids, you're not crazy, you're right. <laughs> and as we did, we opened it up, and it was like a dam break. They just opened up emotionally, spiritually, and began to talk about the characters that spoke to them. One of the kids in the first meeting, I said, what character is the character that, that you've embraced? And he says, this is a kid with very little speech, mind you. Huh. He says, Pinocchio. And I said, why? He says, because, you know, I, I, I feel like a wooden boy. Mm. And I've always dreamed of feeling what real boys feel. Mm. And I was born with wooden eyes. That's a powerful uh, a personal insight that, frankly, a typical 18-year-old would have trouble mustering. Right. And that's the way it worked. And, and his girlfriend in Disney Club, he's been going out for two years with her, Emily. She's a Dumbo girl. <laughs> and she'll explain to you why. Uh, she, uh, she embraced Dumbo. Many of the kids who have no speech, she didn't have speech when she was small, mm -hmm. embraced non-speaking characters, Dumbo, Pluto, who express all emotions without words. Emily will tell you, she says, well, why Dumbo? Because the thing uh, that made him an outcast, those big ears, uh, it, well, that's something I understand she said in my life. Mm. But what Dumbo learned, I learned too. So the thing that makes you different, well, it allows you to soar. And that's, a, again, a powerful notion of how the things that distinguish us are often our greatest gifts, even if the one-size-fits-all models that we often use to judge people and value mm -hmm. them or not value them um, is something that, uh, that we often fall, our, uh, fall into in no, our it really, lives. It really gave them a lexicon of language to communicate, a way in which, and it, it seems to me, Ron, and we only have a minute, um, I've been reading this book, uh, Writing from the Right Side of the Brain, where you know, you're, you're engaging a different side of the brain, the more creative side. Is that what you think they're tapping into through these Disney classics? There's no doubt. And what we have found, and this is the thing that's being studied at, at NIH, uh, at Yale, at, at MIT, all part of this new explosion of affinity therapy, mm -hmm. is that, is that you know, the fact is, is that some of the traditional ways we show ability or cognition, it just doesn't work for these kids. But, but it's just like high school science. The energy goes somewhere if a, if a pathway is blocked. Mm -hmm. They have special abilities in the areas of their affinity. Thank and that's you, what we're now studying. And we're using that to find ways that they could pull themselves forward on their own using these special gifts. And almost every kid's got them. The question is, where is that special gift? And, and we're right now on a, on a kind of national mission and even international. That's what I spoke about at the United Nations. Great. To find those gifts so that these kids can carry forward their own lives powerfully and often with great passion and spiritual energy, which I think is what you're seeing in the book. Life Animated, a story of sidekicks, heroes, and autism by Ron Suskind is available at bookstores everywhere and online. And you can find out more about Ron's Autism Affinities Project by visiting lifeanimated.net.